Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm taking you along with me to the Dead Sea and the Judean Desert. So keep watching for some awesome desert experiences in Israel. What are you working on? Um, just a design for a mural I'm going to do in the Dead Sea. Oh, oh my god, like so casual, no big. Oh yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, heading to the Dead Sea. We're at zero elevation, guys. Don't forget to subscribe and give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Doesn't matter what country I'm in, I'm always prone to an impulse buy because I never have enough sunglasses. <laughs> Welcome to the Dead Sea. If you're visiting Israel, this is absolutely a place you can't miss. We are at the Dead Sea. This is the lowest place on earth. It's like 430 meters below sea level. And this body of water is one of the saltiest in the world you can float and it's really a crazy feeling <laughs> but when you come you got to make sure that you have these super unattractive shoes <laughs> because the ground has a lot of rocks in it it kind of hurts to walk barefoot so pro tip have water shoes you can purchase said water shoes on site or you can grab them on amazon beforehand either way make sure you've got them <laughs> okay nothing's happening yet <laughs> They say if you have like cuts or anything that um, it's gonna hurt. You're gonna feel it. And you should never shave your legs two, day two days before, I think they say. So I didn't shave, so don't look at my legs. Okay, here's how to get in the Dead Sea. Walk out, squat down, and lean back. You'll float immediately. Never lean forward and try to avoid getting your hair wet or any of this water in your mouth. Your hair will be nasty and you'll get a super dry throat. We're at the lowest place on earth, the Dead Sea. Let's go get muddy and dirty. Oh yeah, in this white bathing suit. There goes that bathing suit. If you want a dead sea like the locals, go to Kalia Beach. Unlike the resort areas, this beach has plenty of Dead Sea mud you can pick up right off the ground. Just sides with a little bit mud. Nice. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> don't watch any? Nice feet in Real Dead Sea mud, not the kind that you buy in the store. In the touristy areas, the beach isn't muddy like this, and you have to buy prepackaged mud from the shops to put on your body which obviously isn't as good as the stuff you get from the source itself. Important note, if you get in the Dead Sea, make sure you rinse your body off quickly before sitting in the sun, as you can dehydrate yourself if you leave all that salt on your body. <laughs> Slathering Dead Sea mud all over your body will leave your skin feeling like you spent the day at the spa. All those vitamins and minerals are incredible for your skin. Kalia Beach also has a great restaurant and bar up from the shore. We grabbed some lunch and some cocktails in the shade after a morning in the sun. So my sister Christina is an artist and she applied to be a part of this art project in the desert near the Dead Sea where they are using these old bombed out buildings and painting murals on them. And she got accepted so we're gonna go see how her mural is going. She's been painting it since this morning. After spending the morning by the Dead Sea, we headed to Ain Gedi's spa up on the hillside, which is a quiet place to spend the day relaxing and apparently is even pretty unknown to the locals. It wasn't at all crowded. This spa features a natural mud area, swimming pool, spa treatments, sulfur pools, and a restaurant. There's even an indoor pool filled with Dead Sea water so you can keep floating. This place is the perfect way to unwind and pamper yourself. So I thought this was a cute shot, 
but totally didn't realize this dude in the back was cramping my style. <laughs> We then headed deeper into the desert for our accommodations that evening. If you thought human men were aggressive, check out the male peacocks game. If you're looking for something different in Israel, you gotta check out Kafar Hanakdim. This place is set up to give you a taste of Bedouin life. You can stay in tents or in a cabin, but either way, you're getting a one-of-a-kind experience. I'm kind of glad we didn't get a tent. That would have been a lot to handle. <laughs> Upon arrival, they escort you to the middle of a camp for an authentic Bedouin coffee ceremony. In the past, our dress, the men like me, the women have to cover the head, to cover the face when she go out today. The majority of the women without covering the face. You see a Bedouin woman, woman today, doctors, lawyers, teachers. This place, the Nukdim, it's coming to tell all the citizens of Israel and outside about the Bedouin way in the past. But here in the Negev, the 250,000, you see 50% live in houses and villages, and the other 50% live in tents and huts. When you come to the Bedouin tents, you see inside the tent, TV. Today, our children go to schools, all of them. In the past, no schools. You have a school, you learn from your father, from your mother, and this is the way. So a lot of things change. I ground the coffee here, in this instrument. It's called in Arabic, Al-Azzam, the inviter. very strong without any sweet with cardamom. Usually the Bedouin bring the coffee from Ethiopia, from Yemen. The first cup is called in Arabic, you know, this is for the guest. The second cup. After the coffee ceremony, it's time for dinner. In true Middle Eastern fashion, they bring out tons of food and it is all so delicious. So tonight we're staying at Kafar Hanakdim, which is a Bedouin experience in um, the Negev Desert. And this is my cabin. So I'll show you guys. This is my bed right here. Little bathroom. And then there's this whole other room. More beds. And then there's another one right up here. Going scorpion hunting. Okay, I was scared at first, and then I realized the scorpions are actually pretty small, and the tour guides require sneakers to participate, so really no danger of being stung. I literally thought like a child is crying all night because the peacocks. Insert footage of that here. Peacocks are so loud and they kind of sound like a cat dying. 
but they're so pretty. The next morning, we woke up and explored the grounds on our way to breakfast. They really have so many animals on site here, so it was really cool to get to look around for a bit. Male peacocks are the very colorful, beautiful ones, and the women are sort of blah looking, and it's because the guys have to be pretty to get a girl because she's not pretty. She doesn't care. All right, breakfast time. Israeli breakfast. They told us last night that this place can sleep about 3,000 people. Isn't that what he said? 3,000, something like that. And they have raves here sometime. So I might have to come back for one of those. <laughs> oh, hey, look at all those camels. Hello, camels. On a scale of one to 10, how often do you think these camels have to listen to people going, what day is it? What day is it? Camels are incredible creatures that are specifically designed for the desert. They are truly amazing so, animals. Here me and Joe are riding a camel. <laughs> Bumping along here. <laughs> There's Anna. She likes Macarena dancing. What? Macarena dancing. Macarena dancing? <laughs> <laughs> Camels are ships of the desert. They have specifically designed hooves that allow them to not sink in the sand and they can survive without food and water for a long time. Camels. So bumpy. In more ways than one. Ah. <laughs> Hello, camels. Most people think camels pump, <laughs> store water, but in fact, they actually store fat, which they use to produce energy when food sources are scarce. Next. Located high above the Dead Sea is Masada. To get to the top of Masada, you can either hike up or take the gondola. I recommend the gondola, unless you get an early start on the trail before the heat hits. Masada is one of Israel's most popular tourist attractions. It is also now an Israel National Park and UNESCO World Heritage Site. Here's a bit of history. Herod the Great built two palaces for himself on the mountain and fortified Masada between 37 and 31 BCE. After Herod's death and the annexation of Judea, the Romans built a garrison at Masada. When the Great Revolt of the Jews against the Romans broke out in 66 AD, a group of Jewish people known as the Sakari, led by Menahem, took over the Masada complex. According to Josephus, the siege of Masada by Roman troops at the end of the First Jewish-Roman War ended in the mass suicide of 960 people, the Sakari rebels and their families who were hiding there. The only survivors were two women and five children who lived to tell their stories. Pretty crazy, right?
on a positive note with some cute Israeli wildlife, the Ibex. Stay tuned for more of these guys in my next video. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. And until next time, shalom, y'all.